Within the Spanish Baroque, there are two master painters who both trained in similar areas, knew each other, and worked for King Philip IV of Spain as court painters. Despite all of these similarities, Francisco de Zurbarán and Diego Velázquez had unique painting techniques, different influences, and methods of handling the subject matter of their paintings. Zurbarán and Velázquez also had different amounts of success and misfortune in their personal lives, as well as their professional. As we begin to examine the differences in Zurbarán's and Velázquez's careers, we will start off with a brief overview of their history in order to provide context for their lives and works. Francisco de Zurbarán was born in Fuente de Cando, Spain on November 7, 1598, to a family that welcomed his talents in the arts. As a child, he had such an interest in painting that in 1613, with the permission of his father, Zurbarán entered an apprenticeship with a civilian artist. This apprenticeship ended in 1617 and helped develop Zurbarán as an artist. On January 17, 1616, Dominican monks of San Pablo Real in Seville commissioned 21 paintings from him, with only a few surviving, like this painting of Santo Domingo. In a different commission, this time from the Mercedarians of Seville, his contract required him to relocate to Seville with his family and any assistance that he may have had in his workshop. During this time, he used a technique that was not employed in his well-known pieces. According to Santiago Alcolea, they were less agile and contained backgrounds that varied from dreamlike to architectural. According to Julian Gallego, Zurbarán never lost that sculptured feeling in his figures, unlike Velázquez, who renounced it in favor of atmospheric values. Around 1634, Zurbarán was asked to work with King Philip IV on a project involving the decoration of Salón de Reinos in Madrid. Zurbarán was one of the only painters that was not a part of the court, yet he had a large contribution to the project itself, having large canvases as well as the ten depicting the labors of Hercules. In 1640, there was a noticeable decrease in his amount of works produced and evidence of an inability to keep up with the demands and interests of clientele. Akolay muses that his art reveals a lack of any desire for innovation and, Gallego adds, Zurbarán was incapable of mimicking the change in artistic styles and techniques of this period. The final period of Zurbarán's life was an attempt to recover from the artistic decay of the previous years. There was a noticeable attempt to create and wedge himself into the artistic culture, but, as mentioned before, he could not compete with artists of the time who were already well-versed and well-known. It is as though Zurbarán faded into obscurity within the arts. During this period, there was an abrupt change from his own style in an attempt to keep up with the shifting changes, but along with this change, Akalea points out that Zurbaran developed a set of values that restored the high level of his painting as a final attempt to return to his prime. Francisco Zurbaran died in Madrid on August 27, 1664, leaving behind a legacy for artists and audiences to behold. Born in Seville on June 6, 1599, to a well-decorated family, Diego Velázquez entered a world that was ready for his artistic endeavors. As a child, Velázquez showed proficiency in art, often focusing on it more than his other studies. His family noticed this, so they entered him into an apprenticeship that lasted until 1618 with Francisco Pacheco, who later became his father-in-law. Initially, Velázquez was paired with Francisco Herrera, painter of works such as St. Bonaventure receiving communion from the hands of an angel and St. Basil dictating his doctrine. But Velázquez was scared because of their differences in temperament. According to Carl Justi, author of Velázquez in his times, Velázquez's first patron was Pacheco, who may have seen that his talent was destined to revive the glories of Luis de Vargas and do it well because of his techniques. Under Pacheco's guidance, Velázquez's works were naturalistic, as he didn't often have vibrant paints in his works, and they had a cool, deliberate nature about them. It was in Seville where, years after his apprenticeship with Pacheco, Velázquez was asked to return to Madrid to work by Don Juan de Fonseca y Figueroa. In the same year, Velázquez was asked to join the king's court, where his contract was unique for his age, but admirable due to his talents. He had access to full health benefits and a studio in which he could work whenever he pleased. It was known that Velázquez struggled to establish painting as a nobleman's practice, and he faced barriers due to the questions about his lineage. But despite this, he steadily climbed up the ladder within the court of King Philip IV. Not only was he a court painter that painted the likes of the king, jesters, and others, but he also helped collect artwork for King Philip IV and was deeply intertwined with his family. Velázquez had such a deep connection with King Philip IV that he had a special chair in his studio reserved for the king so that he may watch Velázquez as he worked. His treatment of the royal family as subjects conveyed his close relationship with them. 
Velasquez's work on Las Meninas showed his physical closeness with a family, while also hinting at his role in the court as more than just a courtier. Just supposes that his role in the court was something that he yearned for due to his noble lineage. Velasquez continuously worked to cement his place in the court throughout his life, not only as a painter, but as a nobleman. Up until his death in August 6, 1660, he lived in Madrid. To get a better understanding of the ways the two artists differed, we will analyze one work from each artist in greater detail to see how they differed in their use of contrasting values. Starting with a painting Saint Serapion painted in 1628, Cerberon uses an imagined light, or a light that could not possibly exist in reality, to illuminate the martyr. The light reflecting off of Saint Serapion makes it look as if the figure is standing in full daylight at noon, however the background of the painting has just enough light to be able to see the ropes binding Serapion to a barely visible tree, as if we are viewing a background that was painted when the same scene was occurring in the middle of the night. This is aided by the bright white color of the cloth, creating the effect of casting a spotlight on the figure and minimizing any extra peripheral features. However, this mismatched lighting causes the painting to lose much of its realism, as it doesn't create an effective illusion of space despite the use of tenebrism, which creates the convincing realistic folds of the cloth. This deviation from realism, however, serves a narrative and symbolic purpose. By having Saint Serapion be illuminated by an impossible light source, it gives the impression that Saint Serapion is supernaturally glowing. This serves to mark the painting's occurring narrative as a religious event. It also serves the dual purpose of making Saint Serapion be the sole focus of the painting, while also establishing an empathic connection between the viewer and the saint. Velazquez takes a different approach to the way he handles light in his paintings, particularly in the 1647 painting Venus at Her Mirror. Rather than using imagined lighting like Zuberon, Velazquez uses a more natural lighting that stays consistent throughout the painting instead of changing its rules midway. This lighting creates the illusion of realism in the painting. Velazquez also achieves a greater realism in his painting by using a chiaroscuro painting technique which enables the figures in his paintings to have three-dimensional form by defining the planes of the figure with deep shadows that contrast with the brighter highlights. In comparing other paintings by Zuberan and Velazquez, we can see that they also employ different techniques to create similar subject matter. Zuberan's style, seen in Veronica's Veil, is set on an infinite background of darkness featuring the use of tenebrism in the veil. Velazquez creates contemporary atmospheres for his viewers using different angles or scenes of a well-known and recognizable story. Zuberan's style is more religious. He portrays Christ as belonging to both worlds, while Velazquez emphasizes the sacrifice, humanizing Christ. Zuberan's Christ on the Cross portrays Christ with finely cut, firmly modeled sculptural features. Christ is illuminated by sharp light from the side, contrasting against the black background. There is dual nature to consider, as he is suffering, but he is also not. His body is in the process of dying, but shows no signs of decay. This is because Zerberon chose to make Christ appear physically strong and healthy, which we can see because Christ's upper body is smooth, his arms supple, and light as wings. Zerberon, like many Spanish artists, was attentive in representing the feminine side of Christ, so he depicted the skin on Christ's chest not as taut and thin, but soft. An important feature is the entire sense of pictorial movement created by the white loincloth hanging loosely on Christ's hips. Zuberon wanted Christ to have human characteristics, represented by the feet resting on the pedestal, large and lumpy. They are thick and heavy of someone who has lived close to earth. The positioning of his feet are not immobile, therefore levitation seems possible. In this manner, Zuberon symbolizes the power of Christ. Furthermore, Zuberon creates a sense that Christ belongs equally to two worlds, in a sense that he could be lifted. Velazquez's depiction of the same scene, Christ crucified, has noticeable differences in style. Creating the painting shortly after his return to Spain, Velazquez incorporated classical Greek manner in his work. Velazquez uses contrapposto with Christ's head leaning against his own shoulder to show the suffering that he is experiencing. In contrast to Zuberon's painting, Christ's skin is pale, ashen, and his body is slender. Velazquez also makes the deterioration of Christ more visible in this depiction by the sallow color of his skin and his bleeding hands, feet, and chest. The light behind Christ's head is bright, and the ray shining down on his body creates a sense that he is the cause and source of illumination. The illumination is seen in the shadows under his arms, on the sides of his legs, and on the dark background behind him. His face is mostly hidden from us, covered by his own hair. 
The crown of thorns further emphasizes the humiliation and suffering Christ experienced. This betrayal of Christ humanizes him by displaying the emotion of defeat. The two paintings hold obvious similarities. There's a subject matter, but there are also smaller details to consider. For example, both artists position Christ with his feet together rather than overlapping them. While we see Velasquez as Christ crucified from a frontal stance, with the light source coming slightly from the left of the viewer, Zuberan's Christ on the cross is turned slightly, and the light source comes from the painting itself on the ground to the right. Zuberan makes Christ's loincloth light, translucent and soft. His scene is something the viewer can understand as concrete as it appears that they stumbled upon Christ in reality. Velazquez portrays a scene in drama, displaying Christ's selfless sacrifice and courage. The aura, bleeding, and crown of thorns used by Velazquez emphasize the pain and decline of Christ. Zuberan chose to depict Christ as strong-willed even in his pain and suffering. Additionally, an interesting feature both artists did in different ways was choosing to represent themselves in their paintings, and in their choice of representation, they also show their beliefs and values. Velázquez, known for adding himself to many of his paintings, is likely to have done so because he was so close to the court family. He was able to take the liberty to paint himself with the royal family and not be judged for it. This is something that distinguishes Zerberon from Velázquez and vice versa. In Las Meninas by Velázquez, we essentially have a painting within a painting. We are presented with the image of La Infanta who seems to be the focus of the painting, based on the color palette chosen to depict her. The big mystery and illusion behind this painting is whether the queen and king were present while this image was created or not. We see the reflection of the king and queen in the mirror as if they are viewing the scene from the viewer's position. We don't know if this was intentional from Velázquez or if this was a way to allow the viewer to be able to see through the king and queen's eyes. This was likely done as a way to be able to connect with people who were not able to afford paintings. In a recurring clever way, Velázquez was able to incorporate himself into the painting. He sets himself to one side, on which he is possibly working, and peers over to the king and queen as if requesting their approval. While Velázquez was not in the painting physically, he finds a way to incorporate a small part of himself into the painting. Just as he does in Philip IV of Spain in brown and silver, Velázquez incorporates his signature in the piece of paper that King Philip IV is holding in his hand, showing his close involvement with the court. Unlike Velázquez, Zurbaran did not put himself into court paintings. Instead, he placed himself in more religious paintings, such as St. Luke as painter before Christ on the cross, where it is assumed that Zurbaran depicted himself as St. Luke, which is still highly debated. In this image, St. Luke holds a painting palette on his left hand while looking at Christ on the cross, almost like he is admiring this beautiful painting that he just created. The palette that St. Luke is holding has the same colors presented in the painting itself. Although he is in the painting, unlike Velázquez, Zuberon is not at the same height level as Christ. Rather, he is standing below him, admiring Christ, and also looking up at him in admiration of the creation above him. We are also able to see that Zerberon is shades darker than Christ and is not looking at the viewer, causing him to be much less important to the viewer. Though he does not look at the viewer, he does help them know what to look at. Christ. Christ himself is positioned on the cross with crossed legs and each foot impaled by a nail, unlike the usual depiction of Christ standing on a small pedestal or both feet being nailed with only one nail. Christ is also wearing a loincloth, which allows Zerberon to demonstrate his capacity to create movement. Again, unlike in other paintings of Christ on the cross, we are able to see that Christ has much more hair and a longer beard, which are of a similar color to the wood he is being nailed to. Instead of having Christ look up in acceptance of his fate, he is simply looking down, not necessarily at St. Luke, but rather towards the ground, causing St. Luke to be seen as out of place. In conclusion, Zerberat and Velasquez had many similarities in their painting styles, brought about by them living in the same time period, geographical area, as well as receiving similar training. However, like how the similarities in their paintings correspond to the similarities in their biographies, the myriad of differences in their painting styles, such as their use of chiaroscuro and the general themes of their paintings, can be attributed to the differences the two artists had in their personal and professional lives, as well as their thoughts on their place in the world.